Jessica Xiao. She is a, Jessica is a Washington DC based writer interested in activist culture, radical vulnerability, feminism, race and identity, mass incarceration and climate injustice. You can find her work at Everyday Feminist, The Establishment, Huffington Post, TheHumanist.com and Medium. She is the Prison Book Club Coordinator at Free Minds Book Club and Writing Workshop, a nonprofit serving incarcerated youth tried as adults. From 2015 to 2016, Jessica was the project assistant at the American Humanist Association, operations manager at Humanist Press, and assistant editor at thehumanist.com. She's the co-chair of the Feminist Humanist Alliance, and I can think of no one better to follow the amazing uh, speech that we just heard by Sakivu than Jessica. So let's uh, welcome Jessica Xiao to the stage at uh, California Free Thought Day. like to start with a thank you to David Diskin and I'm gonna take a little bit of time to explain why because my talk was going to be slightly different today I was going to talk about why I don't consider myself a part of this quote-unquote movement as a humanist who these days mostly hangs out in virtual secular spaces and depending on where you stand on what I represent if you are familiar with my views you might be of the opinion that that's not such a bad thing. I was going to talk about how I didn't even think of organized atheism as a movement until I worked at the American Humanist Association in 2015. And this is just by virtue of how I grew up. I'd grown up with what I consider the advantage of being relatively a-religious, except in my family's devotion to education. I never paid God much mind. The only thing I was certain of was that I felt a personal responsibility to participate in efforts to reduce human suffering whenever possible. In university, I made friends and met lovers for whom lack of religiosity was a larger part of their identity. Often, I found this fervor for atheism was proportional to the amount to which these individuals still felt personally pained by their own history as believers or as atheist participants of a theocratic culture that censored the full expression of their identities. Their passion, it was contagious. Although I am no longer on YouTube watching episode upon episode of the atheist experience, although I'm no longer downloading the debates between some figurehead atheist man and William Lane Craig, I did at that time in my life become disturbed by the possible sets of actions and behaviors that result from fundamentalist mindsets. I became disturbed by the way institutional religion and capitalism sometimes act as co-conspirators to maintain a certain degree of complacency in the face of class immobility in a country where we tell people to believe in bootstrapping, rags to riches, American dream that has never quite existed in the form of its mythology for anyone who wasn't already well off, well connected, and well pigmented. I was for a moment an angry atheist. Yet simply because I perceive the fictions of religious belief to be disempowering, sometimes discouraging of self-determination, it would never sanction my interference in how another person should live their life. To suggest that I know better than another is presumptuous, paternalistic, ignorant, unfair, and disrespectful of the very autonomy I supposedly want on their behalf. It's not my business what moral authorities guide one's life until one imposes their moral authorities to restrict the freedom of others. As long as the lives of others could be policed by sexist, homophobic, and racist religious perspectives, I decided I would be concerned. As soon as private thoughts manifest in policy making that perpetuate cultural oppression, I would be concerned. And so I discovered humanism. I discovered voices of those similarly concerned, and so I acknowledged the movement. But still, to me then, I found it unfathomable that humanism wasn't just a default state of being. 
and that naivete is conspicuous today in the era of a Trump presidency. Back then, my relative privilege as a person raised in the upper middle class and white suburban neighborhood where high school sophomores visited college campuses, took advanced placement courses, and for the most part were funneled into four-year liberal arts institutions, after which I imagine they were expected to find lasting fulfillment in some stable white-collar profession. This class privilege both concealed from me the most violent aspects of white supremacy and perhaps was in itself the most dangerous aspect of white supremacy. The kind that deceived me into believing that humanism was a default state of being. The kind of white supremacy that insidiously pervades well-meaning progressive spaces where the idea of humanism is preached over putting it into practice where the idea of humanism is used as a pretext to escape contending with the complex effects of white supremacy in interaction with our various social identities. My relative privilege concealed me from the kind of white supremacy that keeps itself in power, and that very ability to hide is what keeps it in power. Back then, I still found it unfathomable that humanism wasn't just a default state of being because I was still just as indoctrinated by gender expectations and gender roles. I'd learned to be an angry atheist, but I had not yet learned to shed my socialized respectability and be angry for myself, a woman in a society where my words, my wages, my wishes, and my womanhood are docked discounted on the dollar of a man. And what's all this have to do with thanking David? I'll get there. Let's just say that my talk was going to be a little bit angrier. I was going to talk about my disillusionment with a movement that ought to promote secularism and the use of logic and rationality to build a better world, yet in actuality spends the majority of its time debating free speech at the expense of marginalized folks and yelling at fires instead of trying to put them out. Time and again, the quote-unquote mainstream movement is plagued with severe sexism. It is plagued with a lack of true inclusion of people of color, of women of color, by which I mean placing us into positions of leadership with the power to make decisions, not as token figureheads providing the optics of diversity. It is plagued with hero worship at the expense of human rights, equality, and justice. The leadership in its institutions are mostly aging white men with concerns reflective of aging white men, of aging white male donors, but unreflective of the present and unreflective of the future. And despite the dedicated long-time efforts of free thinkers of color, secular women, femmes, non-gender, gender non-conforming and non-binary individuals, the people who are the unseen, uncredited foundation and social glue of secular communities, I still observe that this population is seen as peripheral to a central movement guided by the four horsemen and their ilk. I was going to talk today about exactly how disrespectful it is to give a platform to someone who uses feminism as part of his own brand while exerting power in anti-feminist ways. You may not know this, but there was a man scheduled to speak here today who has been publicly accused of sexual harassment, who is suing several women and an atheist publication for defamation, a man who is still quite beloved in the movement. And I was going to make clear exactly what message it sends to me and to all freethinker, skeptic, atheist, humanist, ethicalist, unitarian, universalist women, when a man accused of sexually harassing multiple women who is silencing these women via a defamation suit, an event widely aired in movement circles, is still invited to free thought events. Let me make this clear. The message this sends is that women are still on the sidelines, that the humanity of those who are not white men of particular backgrounds is less important in varying degrees, that women are less important. And so when I was asked to speak here today, I had a dilemma to face. Decline on the moral grounds to not speak or to use my time allotted to point out the ways power is disproportionately distributed at the expense of women. Were there more than two options? Yes. But these were the only two I felt were strategically within my bounds at the time. 
and you know which one I chose because I am here today. Could I have said to David, hey, you've invited to Free Thought Day someone who is at the least suppressing accusations of harassment, and if we take women at the word, which time and again we have proven not to be good at, you've invited to Free Thought Day someone who is quite possibly actually dangerous? Such an action is negligent to our safety. What are you going to do about it? Perhaps I could have said this. But to be honest, I thought it must have been such a well-known and well-publicized fact amongst conference organizers and those well-connected in U.S. establishment atheist circles that David could not possibly not know, especially as a seasoned event organizer who I assume vets the people he invites. And as an unknown in the movement, the once program's assistant at the AHA, editor at thehumanist.com, and so on, I was and remain unwilling to give men in positions of power the benefit of believing they will act on a grievance I bring privately. Yet instead, today, I am glad to say I was wrong on my instinct with regard to David. I'm glad today instead to be able to say thank you for choosing women and for disinviting someone who is actively trying to discredit them at the risk of ending a personal friendship. Thank you for supporting feminism. Thank you for the concrete action towards building a more equitable movement that is representative of the just future our work informs. Yet why does this happen when we are a community that espouses equality? that cares about human rights, that wants the best for humanity. Are these assumptions of atheism I should not make? There is a collective propensity to invite men known to be unsafe to women to speak at events, for men to monopolize space in progressive settings while professing pride in their dedication to fighting inequality, and for the movement to continue to revere, award, or amplify those with homophobic, racist, and sexist views. And the short answer is that we are racist, we are homophobic, and we are sexist. But that's not convincing enough. It certainly hasn't been, and especially not coming from a woman. It is certainly not an answer our hearts want to accept. So what is the long answer? The long answer is that what David did, take action to keep this event accountable to women, that is not the norm. The norm is to tell the harm that they are making a big deal out of nothing until they start believing it and stop reporting unjust behavior. The norm is to say that the claims of harm are exaggerated and are untrue until they second guess each memory. The norm is to tell the harm that they are not credible sources, spiteful or resentful, hysterical or irrational. And the norm is to say anyone of a marginalized group is overreacting as if having emotions about oppressive acts is symptomatic of irrationality rendering lived experiences somehow less deserving of consideration based just on how it's expressed. The norm is for those in power to ask, how many times must the transgressor explain that they have reformed? And how many times must he atone for his transgressions? Instead of asking whether healing is taking place. We are seeing this play out again in Harvey Weinstein. I see my guy friends, some who strongly associate their own identity with being supporters of feminist values, struggle to comprehend how their seemingly innocuous actions contribute to rape culture. I know it is not easy to look at normal with a discerning gaze if it has not betrayed you. But for me and others like me, normal has not betrayed me because it has never ultimately been established to serve me. And it is time to question the norms. The norms in the way we conduct politics, the ones that Trump himself is ignoring in his own civil disobedience, the norms of the relationships we have with other people and the kinds of relationships we want to have with other people, the kinds of relationships we want to have with our own values and how they manifest in the world, the kinds of relationships we want to cultivate in the next generation to want for themselves. What types of communities, movements, and ways of being bring us fulfillment and move us forward? Because as you know, we live in a time of big problems, with new ones created by this administration or brought to light by witnesses of history in the making every week. We cannot focus on all of them as daunting and complex as they are. 
but we can work on fostering and building our own communities, whatever a community means to you. I would argue it's not only work we must do, but a form of self-love. To engage in nurturing the respectful, emotionally literate, healthy, and safe communities that we deserve is a form of self-care. It is a necessary privilege. How do we do that, and where do we start? We have to check whether our use of skepticism, our tools of critical thinking, whether these are fairly applied. We need to check our biases and our emotional resistance to having our biases checked. We need to be aware and sit with our emotional resistance to being denied access to spaces that we are not entitled to. We need to understand that the reason there are more men in this movement isn't because men are less religious by some immutable characteristic of being a man. We need to understand that white people are not more rational than people of color because they dominate the narratives in the atheist movement. We need to understand why, whether we like or dislike the term identity politics, whether we understand intersectionality or willfully disdain it, whatever it means to you now, we need to understand we ourselves are not free of time and space, we're not free of our history, of geography, roots, gender expectations, generational expectations, skin color, personal traumas, culture. We do not live in a societal vacuum where each of us is a blank slate who does not carry the history of the generations before us. We are not blank slates that haven't internalized the weight of the injustices of the societies in which we live. And we must understand why we are fraught with emotion at the implications that we need to extend more empathy and be better for communities whose complexities are less carved out in public narrative. Does that require of us more self-reflection? More self-awareness? Yes. Can self-monitoring the way we interact with others by holding knowledge of our relative positions in society feel oppressive? Perhaps, if you've never had to look upon anyone else as an equal. And the visceral reactions to a statement like this is usually offense. But I would like it to be acceptance. When I say you do not look upon me as an equal, I do not imbue this statement with moral condemnation because I cannot afford to. Moral condemnation of the fact that we all have implicit biases leads to dangerous reactions like denial, guilt, and shame, allowing these biases to manifest in harmful ways that continue to contribute to systems and institutions upholding oppression, instead of letting the fact that we are biased exist as fertile ground where change can take place. Change also requires us to face the truth. We don't have to become cynical, even as we face the realities of living in a country founded on white supremacy, a country that still suffers its ills. And there is no washing of this fact to make it any less demoralizing. If we want to get somewhere valid, we must start with accurate premises that are not couched in euphemisms and pleasantries that wash away the lived experiences of minorities, the deaths of black and brown people, of the homeless, of the mentally ill at the hands of government-sanctioned violence, at the hands of police officers. We cannot ignore growing in a country that still suffers the cognitive dissonance between embracing the wide spectrum of human sexuality and the heteronormative beliefs about gender roles, that support rape culture, objectification of women, and misogyny. We cannot neglect that emotional inequality is so staggering we can barely understand it, or that our institutions of public education teach us only how to accept the status quo. We need to look at our geographic bubbles and our online networks and who they are not showing to us. We don't have to seek out political ideologies we already know are dehumanizing, but we need to hear stories of individuals least heard, not narratives you've heard multiple times in the media, and we need to hear them from those belonging to communities where these stories, these truths take place, and we need to believe them to hold truths about how life is experienced. Believe them to hold realities you may never be forced yourself to consider. And we must not let one single story define an entire community, usually the one confirming our beliefs about the world be the only one that we choose to take seriously. We live in isms and multiple social realities. The world is too complex for that. 
It's difficult because flexibility and open-mindedness and selfless imagination are difficult. But there is a silver lining. Having faith in other people is equivalent to having faith in ourselves. Our society requires transformation, and transformation requires exercising our imagination, prawning our spheres of collective empathy, and the meditation on how to cultivate communities we hold dear. If we are capable of transformation, others are. And if others are, we must be capable of transformation. So where do we start? I ask again, within ourselves, with our friends, with our family, our colleagues, our neighbors. But I recognize that the personal stakes here are quite high, even if this is where we have the most control. So maybe we start a little bit more broadly in these new communities that we're building for this godless world to face. Today, I would like to end with this thank you to David Diskin, because today I got to talk about how to create the change we want to see in the world together, and how confident I am that we are able to do it together. I'm hoping that I can start to realize I have a place in this movement, too. And I wasn't too sure about that until now. Thank you.